Hello and welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 11th to 17th of October, 2021. I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host Jean Deville. Before getting into this week's news updates, a special shout out to our good friends at Go Taikonauts and SpaceWatch Global, two excellent sources for space industry news. Also, a kind reminder that if you've not done so already, you should go and check out the Dongfang Hour newsletter at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. We have about eight to ten additional news updates every week in the newsletter. Getting to this week's pieces of news, this week we will bring you a breakdown of the Shenzhou 13 launch from earlier in the week. We will discuss a Long March 2D rideshare launch with 11 satellites. But first, Jean will give us a breakdown of a vertical takeoff, vertical landing test conducted by Deep Blue Aerospace. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So, John, one of my favorite abbreviations for a Chinese commercial space company name, DBA. What are they doing over in Shanxi Province? So, a lot of stuff to report over the past few days. Deep Blue Aerospace completed a 100 meter level vertical takeoff, vertical landing test of its Nebula M rocket on Wednesday, October the 13th, and this can really be seen as a striking sign of the fast paced R and D that's going on. At DBA, and if you've been watching Dongfang Hour for a while, you may remember that we reported that DBA had done a wet dress rehearsal of their Nebula M test rocket in December 2020, and after that, a first static fire test in mid July this year, followed by a meter level hop at the end of、uh, the same month. And now we are at a hundred meter level hop in mid October, and that's really some amazing progress in just. Ten months, and also in stark contrast with the only other Chinese commercial launch company that has done that,、uh, which is Link Space. But those guys did it over a period of five years, between 2014 and 2019, and that's before going very quiet and stealthy over the past two years. Now, as a quick reminder to our listeners on the Nebula M rocket that was just tested a couple of days ago, the Nebula M is a very small single-stage rocket prototype that's meant to be a vertical takeoff, vertical landing. Demonstrator, and it is equipped with a single Latin Five engine, which is a Carolox engine that uses an electrical pump to feed the propellants into the combustion chamber. And this is a definite advantage for VTVL, especially in a single engine architecture, because according to DBA, this enables、uh, them to throttle the engine significantly, notably during the landing process. Now, I expect DBA probably to be performing many more of such hops over the coming months, and that's because they probably want to gather as much data as possible on the vertical takeoff, vertical landing process to optimize the flight control systems during the vertical landing. And that's because vertical landing is really a very tricky thing to do. And I think that the vertical takeoff, vertical landing that took place on Wednesday is a perfect illustration of that. Because while it is undeniable that the test was a success, you can also observe that the landing process was not as smooth as it could have. Have been, and that more work needs to be done during the final few seconds of flight to guarantee a soft touchdown. Now, a quick reminder of Deep Blue Aerospace's upcoming rocket family and what it consists in. We have first and foremost an expendable Carolox small lift rocket that's able to put 500 kilograms of payload into sun synchronous orbit, and this rocket is called the Nebula One. Then we have a much larger medium lift rocket that's reusable. That's that's also a Carolox rocket that's called the Nebula Two, and that will be able to put 4.5 tons into low Earth orbit. Now, having said that, I think that DBA is still a long way from actually being able to commercialize any of the launch services from these launch vehicles, and that's because when you look at the you know the state of advancement of DBA today, they have not performed、uh, a suborbital or orbital test just yet. And the Latin Five engine that was used in the Nebula M rocket a couple of days ago, well, this engine is not even the one that will be powering the Nebula Two rocket.、Uh, that's much larger. That needs you know heavier thrust engines, and for that, DBA is developing another engine called the Latin. 20, which is a 20-ton thrust class、uh, Carolox engine, and so、um, there are still, to a very large extent, in the R and D phase, but they are definitely moving very fast. So that really not taking any credit away from them for that. And the last thing that I want to say also is that.、Um, 
you know, they've they've really put together a very solid team over the past few months and years. I think that the CEO is a former CTO of Landspace, I believe. And they've also started to collaborate with uh, the former chief engineer of the crude space program in China called Huang Chunping. And more generally, also, I want to add that they're one of the most open Chinese commercial launch companies. Um, I know that they, they communicate a lot. We get articles, we get videos of what they are doing. So really kudos to DBA for doing that. And hopefully that will really become a common practice in the entire Chinese commercial space sector. Um, so very cool stuff from DBA this week. Blaine, do you have any thoughts on that or anything else to to add? Definitely. So just a very small point to uh, to add to your one of your last comments. I, I believe the CEO of uh, DBA comes from one space. I think the former land space oh. CTO Kang Yong Lai is over at uh, at Space Pioneer or Kanbing mm. Aerospace, I think, although I we can double check on that. Um, so just to unpack a little bit more the VTVL launch and, and I guess more specifically the area of China where the launch took place. Um, so as John mentioned, the launch took place over in uh, DBA's facility in Tongchuan in, in Shanxi province, relatively close to the city of, uh, of Xi'an. And these two cities, Tongchuan and Xi'an, they have uh, over the past handful of years developed into one of the premier commercial space industry clusters in China. And so just to review a little bit, uh, so Xi'an for a very long time has been a center of the Chinese space sector, in particular the launch sector, with the city having previously earned the nickname of the hometown of Chinese aerospace propulsion, or Zhongguo Hangtian Dongli Zhexiang. Um, and as we've covered in the Dongfang Hour before, you do have several major CALT uh, subsidiaries, namely the AALPT and the Xi'an Aerospace Propulsion Institute located in Xi'an. And I would point out that uh, there's a lot of talent in these two companies, a lot of very high level rocket scientists. And indeed, the latter company I just mentioned, the Xi'an Aerospace Propulsion Institute, uh, was the source of some controversy a few years ago when one of their high level engineers, uh, Zhang Xiaoping, um, was one of the first big uh, state employees to make a move to a commercial company when he moved over to land space. And that created some controversy about uh, the sort of movement of talent from commercial companies over to to launch uh, to Sorry, the movement of talent from state-owned companies over to commercial companies. And so, again, um, as we've seen in, over these, you know, quite some years, Xi'an has been a, a home of the launch industry in China for quite some time. Uh, that being said, in more recent years, there's been a pretty robust commercial space sector that has developed in, in Xi'an and also to an extent in Tongchuan. And this has been, to a certain extent, enabled by the presence of the traditional launch sector in the um, in the region. And so in addition to Deep Blue Aerospace, which has some facilities in, uh, in Tongchuan, we've also seen commercial launch companies Landspace, S-Motor, OneSpace, and others establish R&D facilities in the area. And I think it's safe to say that Xi'an and Tongchuan are probably home to the second largest agglomeration of rocket industry talent in China behind only the Huojianjie, or the Rocket Street area of Yizhuang in, in Beijing. Um, and so I would also point out that the Xi'an and Tongchuan area have seen in recent years a development of a kind of SAR Earth observation cluster. So we've talked about SAR a little bit on the Dongfang Hour before, synthetic aperture radar satellites, basically satellites that use radar to take photos of the Earth. And we've seen uh, the, probably the best example of this is a small satellite manufacturer, Smart Satellite, relocating its headquarters from Beijing to Tongchuan City uh, and at the same time announcing a contract with the city of Tongchuan for a SAR constellation of 12 satellites, the, the Silk Road constellation, if I'm not wrong. And so again, we're seeing, in addition to the launch sector, a an Earth observation, and particularly a SAR Earth observation sector developing in Xi'an and in Tongchuan in, in Shanxi province. And I would just mention the last cluster in this area, in the space sector in general, and also in commercial space, is a TTNC cluster. Uh, so in addition to being home to the China Satellite Launch Tracking and Control Centers, the CLTC, uh, Xi'an and Tongchuan are also home to multiple commercial TTNC companies. And I would uh, point out that most of these commercial space initiatives, or many of them, are clustered around the Xi'an Civil Aerospace Industrial Base, which is a major project that became a national 5A level industrial base in April of 2021, which is noteworthy because it made this industrial base the only national level economic and technological development zone focused on the aerospace industry. It is one of the larger aerospace and space focused uh, economic development zones in China. And a recent report from CGTN noted that, I quote, the industrial park has actively brought in new pilot projects to forge an aerospace industrial cluster, which incorporates commercial satellite systems, rocket development and the commercial use of satellites. 
And so just a last anecdote on the Xi'an National Aerospace Industrial Base. We did see an interesting article in March of 2020 about a 100 million U.S. dollar bond issuance from the Xi'an Aerospace High Tech Industry Development Fund, which is a fund that is ultimately owned by the Xi'an municipal government. And the bond issuance is interesting for a couple of reasons. So first, it was led by Davis Polk, which, as far as I know, is a Western financial institution. Um, and then it's also interesting because it gives us a little bit of insight into how these different sort of development funds are being financed. So apparently you have a fairly traditional $100 million bond offering at 6.5% coupon per year expiring in 2023. And um, this is how they raise money to finance these commercial space companies in some instances. So, again, a lot of interesting things going on over in uh, in Xi'an and, and to an extent Tongchuan. And just to close out on, on the, this topic, so we do also have a handful of specific space initiatives in the city of Tongchuan. So this includes the city's detailed plan for the aerospace city area of Tongchuan high-tech industrial development zone, as well as the Tongchuan commercial aerospace industry development plan. And uh, there was, there is indeed being developed a smart rocket, a smart commercial solid rocket assembly center in Tongchuan, uh, which has a total investment of 1 billion RMB or around 140 million U.S. dollars. So just to sum up, I think it's very safe to say that moving forward, we're going to see a continued increase in commercial space activity in the kind of Xi'an and Tongchuan region. And we are likely to see this area develop into one of the top, say, three or five, probably more like five uh, space industry clusters in, in China over the coming handful of years. So definitely exciting stuff from uh, from Deep Blue Aerospace and uh, and from Shanxi province more uh, more generally. So, uh, Jean, unless you have anything else to add on uh, Deep Blue Aerospace, do you want to take us into uh, into Shenzhou 13? Absolutely. I think that was the other very big news of the week. We saw the successful launch of the Shenzhou 13 crew mission to the Chinese space station on the evening of Friday, the 15th of October. Or actually, if you're looking at Beijing time, we're talking about early morning on Saturday, the 16th. We saw Long March 2F liftoff from the Zhou Chuan Satellite Launch Center in North China, putting a Shenzhou spacecraft carrying three Taikonauts into orbit. And the three Taikonauts of the Shenzhou 13 mission were uh, Jai Zhigong, Wang Yaping and Ye Guangfu, who were actually the backup crew of the previous mission, the Shenzhou 12, which wrapped up in September, so just barely a month ago. And for two of the three Taikonauts of Shenzhou 13, this actually represents a second flight into space for them. And so just to go through the three members of the crew, we have firstly Jai Jigong, who is the oldest Taikonaut and also the commander of this mission. And he was the first Chinese to ever perform a spacewalk during the Shenzhou 7 mission in 2008. And he was also the person that was in the famous picture shot during the very first spacewalk during Shenzhou 7, where you could see a Taikonaut waving a Chinese flag. The second Taikonaut is Wang Yaping. She's the first woman to board the Tianhe core module. And Shenzhou 13, as mentioned, also represents her second flight. She was part of the Shenzhou 10 crew in 2013. And she's notably remembered for having performed a live broadcast of a physics lesson to Chinese lower school students that was, uh, at the time, extremely popular. And the last Taikonaut is Ye Guangfu, and this will represent the first flight into space for him. He's barely 41 years old. And a fun fact on Ye Guangfu, he was actually the Taikonaut that was selected in 2016 and sent to Sardinia to train with ESA astronauts in 2016. And he was also part of the 16 Taikonauts that trained with two ESA astronauts in China in 2017. So it is possible that Ye Guangfu will play some role at some point in a future ESA astronaut stay in the Chinese space station after 2022, if that ever happens. Now, back to the Shenzhou 13. The Shenzhou 13 uh, spacecraft docked six and a half hours after liftoff, kicking off the six month stay of the Shenzhou 13 crew. And this will represent the longest consecutive stay ever for the Chinese, breaking the records of three months established one month earlier by the Shenzhou 12 mission. So we can ask ourselves, you know, what will be some of the main tasks that Jai Jigong, Wang Yaping, and Ye Guangfu will be performing over the next six months? And so to answer that question, I just want to add first that the Shenzhou 13 mission represents the fifth and final mission of the so-called critical technology verification phase, which was kicked off in March 2020 with the launch of the Tianhe core module into space. And then we had following that two Tianzhou spacecraft and two Shenzhou missions, including the one that took place a couple of uh, hours ago, basically the Shenzhou 13. And the objective of all of these missions basically is to validate the performance 
of the Tianhe One core module from all aspects, you know, the life support systems, the guidance, navigation and control, uh, the refueling, the docking, the power supply, um, also the communication systems, just you name it. And so just to list a few of the tasks that the Shenzhou 13 crew will be doing, we'll have, among other things, the validation of the Shenzhou spacecraft docking to the Nadir port of the multi-docking nod. And this actually already took place a couple of hours ago when the uh, Shenzhou spacecraft docked with the multi-docking nod. It docked directly with the Nadir port. A second task will be to oversee the robotic arm of the space station, transferring the Tianzhou 2 cargo spacecraft, which is currently docked to the front docking port, uh, to one of the side docking ports. And uh, the need for this is next year when we will have the Meng Tian and the Wentian experimental modules docked to one of the side ports of the multi-docking nod. Well, basically these experimental modules, they have their own lie-up arm that can sort of transfer these modules to one of the side docking ports. But in case something goes wrong, the robotic arm uh, needs to be able to perform this task if necessary. And this is why the robotic arm is sort of practicing and validating this move uh, with the Tianzhou 2 spacecraft in you know the coming weeks or coming months. Some of the other tasks that will be uh, validating the remote operation of the robotic arm. There will be also some microgravity and space medicine experiments. There will be some space outreach events. So I, I suspect this refers to possibly Wang Yaping doing another physics lesson and broadcasting it live to China because that was something that was very appreciated uh, back then by the Chinese. And there will also be two to three EVAs, extravehicular activities, also known as spacewalks. And finally, it will just be overall Shinto 13 will be validating the concept of having Chinese uh, astronauts, taikonauts, stay in the Chinese space station for six months straight. Because while this is a routine on the ISS, this is really the first time, as mentioned previously, for the Chinese. And so they really need to validate this because this will be the standard duration for all future uh, Shenzhou missions to the Chinese space station. So really a very important launch with Shenzhou 13 this week. Uh, but Blaine, going back to commercial space, there was also a slightly lower key launch this week, but that was also still very significant. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that or just any other comments otherwise on, on Shenzhou 13? For sure. So just a brief comment on Shenzhou 13. I think it's worth noting that... Uh, you know, this is very soon after Shenzhou 12 and that the time frame between Shenzhou 11 and Shenzhou 12 was about five years. So basically, we went from 2016 until early 2021 with no no Chinese taikonauts in space. And, and now we, we seem to be at a point where we're going to basically have taikonauts more or less continuously in space uh, for the foreseeable future. So definitely an interesting time to um, to reach. But indeed, uh, there was a Long March 2D launch earlier this week on Thursday, uh, which occurred from the Taiyuan Launch Center. And the Long March 2D launch was interesting because it had 11 satellites, of which eight were small sats that had been launched in a ride share that seemed to have been arranged by China Great Wall Industry Corporation, or CGWIC, a commercial subsidiary of CASC. And so a couple of noteworthy elements of this launch. So first, it was the first time that we had seen a Long March 2D deploy more than 10 satellites in a single launch, which is a pretty big milestone when you consider that we are going to have more and more small satellites being launched on ride shares. Um, it's also the 55th launch of the Long March 2D, and it is uh, the first time that the rocket used grid fins on its first stage in an effort to have better control over the landing area of that first stage as it falls back to Earth. Um, so just a quick reminder, the Long March 2D is a two-stage liquid-fueled rocket manufactured by SAST, a major subsidiary of CASC, and is capable of lifting around 1,200 kilograms to a 700-kilometer sun-synchronous orbit. And so we can assume that these 11 satellites probably had a combined payload of somewhere in the neighborhood of 1200 ish kilograms and so to get into some of these different payloads that were launched on the long march 2d the longest pay of uh, the largest payload and also one that was very likely not arranged by cgwic was the china's first solar observatory the china h alpha solar explorer or chase uh, which we discussed in some detail during our Zhuhai Air Show debrief episode a couple of weeks ago. And so just a quick review, Chase is going to be imaging parts of the sun in specific wavelengths, aiming to capture certain solar phenomena such as solar prominences. And as a reminder, Chase is going to be using the H-alpha frequency, which is a deep red spectral line at a wavelength of 656.28 nanometers. 
The launch also included the Tianshu-1 satellite, an enhanced GNSS satellite bound for low Earth orbit and to be operated by Chinese commercial company FireEye Positioning, an enhanced navigation and location-based services company founded in 2019. And so I did a little bit of digging on FireEye. I had not heard too much about them before. Uh, interestingly, they did complete a 30 million RMB Series A round of funding in 2020. And at the time of that funding round, they noted plans for a launch of a test satellite by mid-2021. So we apparently have a slight but not too big of a delay there. A couple of the other satellites that were launched on this Long March 2D were manufactured by Cask subsidiary Shenzhen Aerospace Dongfang Hong, a friend of the Dongfang Hour. And uh, these two satellites were pretty pretty interesting couple of satellites. So the first one was called the Commercial Meteorological Observation Constellation Test Satellite, which will be used for, among other things, um, gathering information about uh, the atmosphere and meteorology using signals from navigation satellites and so and apparently for commercial applications so this is something that i had not heard about before but we have a commercial meteorological uh, observation constellation test satellite the other satellite that was manufactured by shenzhen dongfang hong was a low earth orbit atmospheric density detection satellite which will carry out verification for obtaining low earth orbit atmosphere density and uh, composition of the the atmosphere so again a couple of meteorological type satellites that were manufactured by shenzhen dongfang hong for this launch uh, just to review a couple of the commercial payloads so we had two satellites that were manufactured for head aerospace which is a european chinese company that does among other things uh, has plans for a constellation of sort of earth observation iot type of satellites we also had a satellite that was launched for apsco which was made in partnership with commercial satellite manufacturer minospace and a test satellite for Hong Kong-based HKATG, which was interestingly apparently launched by the company's Shenzhen subsidiary, uh, which is uh, Ganghangke Shenzhen Kongjian Jixu Youxian Gongse. Uh, so again, a, a seeming Chinese subsidiary of that Hong Kong-based company. Uh, so a couple of final points of note about this launch. So unsurprisingly, we saw an announcement from commercial TTNC company Satellite Herd that they had provided TTNC services for six of the satellites, including two of the head aerospace satellites. And just a short reminder, Satellite Herd and TTNC more generally, this is a service whereby a company that has some antennas on the ground would help a satellite operator to track its satellite during the launch to communicate it as it's being deployed to communicate with it as it is being deployed, um, and then to to maintain connectivity with the satellite as it's in orbit. So again, as is becoming quite routine now in these commercial launches, we did see that Shat Satellite Herd is providing the TTNC services for most of the commercial satellites. So overall, definitely the launch comes at a very interesting time. As we noted a couple of weeks ago at the Zhuhai Air Show, there were a couple of pretty significant contracts signed between commercial satellite manufacturers and primarily China Great Wall for ride share on, on launches, primarily with the Long March 8, but also with the Long March 2D. And I think that this launch is but the latest example of this ride share phenomenon in China, this idea that you have a national level project like the Chase uh, satellite that I mentioned earlier, which is around 500 kilograms. It accounts for 35, 40 percent of the rocket's total payload. And you can then have the rest of the payload be uh, be allocated to a variety of smaller commercial satellites that have the need to, to launch. So, again, I think that when looking back at these couple of weeks, seeing the large number of rideshare contracts, the Zhuhai Air Show, and then seeing this pretty publicized rideshare launch this week on a Long March 2D, I think we're going to look back at this and say, well, this has been a very interesting turning point for rideshare and for, um, I suppose, just launch more generally in China. And so, yeah, really, um, definitely an interesting launch on this Long March 2D. Uh, Jean, anything to add from your side on any of those satellites or uh, or the launch more generally? I think uh, I think I'm all good. Excellent. Well, with that, this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. This for the week of the 11th to 17th of October, 2021. As I mentioned earlier, if you've not yet subscribed to our newsletter, I would highly ch recommend checking it out at newsletter.dongfanghour.com. In the meantime, I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville, and uh, looking forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.